Hello, and welcome to Making the Rounds, a podcast by the American Medical Association. Today's episode is part of our Health IT series from the AMA MSS Committee on Health Information and Technology. My name is Christopher Jackson, and I'm a medical student at the University of Toledo College of Medicine, and I'll be your host for today. Today, we're joined by Dr. Oliver Alami, an Associate Professor of Vascular Surgery at Stanford. Dr. Alami is an expert on digital health and biodesign. Hello and welcome, Dr. Alami. Hi, thank you so much for uh, having me today, Chris. Um, so Great just to get you. started, um, can you tell everybody how you're involved in the health IT space and what you're currently working on? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I'm actually, I'm a vascular surgeon first. That's, I wear multiple hats. That's the main hat I wear. But my main focus in research is around the clinical validation of the sensors in smartphones, smartwatches, wearables in patients with cardiovascular disease. And um, I basically started this journey years ago, and it was in the emergency room seeing patients uh, that I had placed stents in, uh, in the peripheral arteries, such as a superficial femoral artery. And the patients would come and they'd say, you know, I, I wasn't feeling so great two, three months ago. I couldn't walk as far. But uh, I thought, you know, why did I, it, I hope it gets better. And next thing you know, they show up in the ED and the stent is completely occluded. And what's interesting about peripheral artery disease, which is the area of specialty that vascular surgeons work in, is that the, um, the kind of restenosis that you get or the scarring within the stents after placement um, is very, you know, correlates very well with how far you can walk. You know, they basically get what's called claudication, which is angina of the leg calf muscles, you know, with effort. So it's very, it's, it's, it's very predictable. And so that's when kind of it went off in my head, or I had this idea. I was like, well, what if, if we could track just passively patient's activity, is there a correlation between the ability to walk and, or how far someone can walk and, um, and the degree of disease or stenosis? So, uh, so basically there's a strong correlation you know, I felt our, our hypothesis was that maybe there's a strong core or there is a strong correlation between the degree of or the disease burden, you know, the amount of restenosis after placing a stent. And it's very predictable. I mean, these stents often, you know, 60 percent of them fail within a year or two. Um, so maybe there is a strong correlation between the degree of, of stenosis, disease burden and how far someone can walk. So if we track someone passively, could we correlate? Uh, that, you know, their activity with degree of stenosis. So that's kind of how this, my journey started with all this years ago. This is about five, six years ago. And, you know, then when I said, okay, let's, let's start looking at these uh, phones and what metrics they're measuring and collecting. And I realized right away that these, the algorithms on these devices were not developed with cardi, you know, patients that look like my patients. <laughs> and in fact, they were, you know, all young 20 year old triathletes, and so I, I had to take a step back and say, you know what, I got to I got to validate, you know, what the step counts are and what, you know, what the signal is that these devices are picking up in these older patients that often use canes, walkers, things like that. So that's kind of how my journey started. And I can go into in many directions from there. Well, I think I know that with the wearable, the wearable and mobile data, that there's a lot of noise and they're not always the most. I'm trying to think of the right word clean data set, I guess is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So how do you dig through that and how do you validate that so that you know that what you're getting from patient A is the same as patient B? I mean, you've got the old, uh, I don't know, pedometer where somebody is shaking it with their hand and then they get to their thousand steps to win the office prize. So how do you compare that? Yeah, when you have time series data like, you know, step counts or heart, you know, uh, heart rate, you know, that you have over time, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of a lot of noise and that that's where the data science part comes in. You know, how do you, you know, is there signal in the noise and how do you pick out the signal in the noise? And, um, and that's, you know, it's, it's very challenging and I think it's very, you know, disease specific, depending on what you're trying to pick up, what you're trying to measure. I'll give you one very high level thing that we, you know, ended up working on and are continuing to validate is you know, we were very focused on step counts. First of all, we realized that the distance 
calculation or algorithm at the time that we did our main studies in patients with cardiovascular disease, both both pre and post intervention, you know, the distance algorithm was way off, like 50% accurate only. And it's partly because we think from what we could figure out, because they never exposed their algorithms on these devices, is that the estimation of the stride length, you know, was probably what was way off, right? The stride length of our older cardiovascular patients were pro- was probably a lot shorter than the stride length of a young 20 year old or whatever. So we focused heavily on step counts, which ended up being pretty accurate, as accurate as, you know, as the kind of research grade pedometers. And so it was about 90, I would say about 90, you know, five, six percent accurate, which is pretty impressive in these older patients. So we focused heavily. So we had all this step count data over months, you know, six months of step count data in these really sick patients or patients with a lot of comorbidities who'd end up in the ER for various reasons. And, you know, some even passed and. And so we have this uh, data set and what we realized, you know, if you look at the daily step count, like if I showed you my step count today, it's actually not very meaningful. (laughs) You know, what's more interesting when you have this longitudinal data is to do something that really COVID has brought, you know, has kind of popularized is this concept of a seven day moving average or 14 day moving average. Uh, And that's that simple step you know, uh, is actually um, helps correlate with clinical, you know, where someone is going or where they are in a major way. And when it comes to step count, there's, um, there's this concept as well of frailty. I don't know if you've heard of the term frailty or the concept of frailty. So, so this is one area where, you know, can you, can this be a, 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 can you use, you know, passive activity Counts that you get just from someone's phone that they carry with them all day as a vital sign, right? Let's say you show up to the ER and you've got, you know, stomach, vague stomach symptoms that you would normally say, oh, it's probably just an upset stomach. Here, take take some Pepsid and you should be fine. But if you give me, you know, you gave the ER physician, you said, okay, here's their activity index, right? Not only is it low, it's in kind of the frailty mode, but if I give you the derivative of that, you know, that gives you the slope, you can see it's been declining over time. Would I perhaps, you know, get another study? You know, would I get that CT scan to show me that in fact, there's a gastric tumor, or gastric cancer? I don't know, you know, but I'm just saying it could, there are some use cases, but it all needs to be validated, right? And all needs to be, you know, popularized, number one, made available, put into the workflow. And it takes time. I, I don't know if you've read or heard of the story of even the thermometer, you know, when they first, in, when a uh, European doctor first introduced the concept of a thermometer, it took like 75 years <laughs> before people believed that the the thermometer was more objective than the physician's hand on someone's forehead, right? They all thought, oh no, my, my hand on the forehead is way better than a thermometer. What is this tool? So it takes time. It takes time. Um. So if you're using this wearable data so often, what do you think the future of it is going to be? Because right now I feel like we're in kind of the beginning phases of wearables and healthcare. Where do you think yeah. that might go? Great question. Great question. There's, I am, you know, I am, I have, I, I drink the Kool-Aid every day. You know, I'm, I see the potential. I see tremendous potential in what this could offer to providers and maybe, and more importantly now to patients. Right. Uh, there's this big movement towards the towards the consumerization of healthcare in many ways. And, you know, I, um, you know, one of my other hats that I wear, I'm the director by design for digital health. So I teach around digital health and, um, you know, where can it be implemented? How do you design for it? Um, how do you build uh, digital health tools and so on? And. When you talk about the future of digital health, what's been really frustrating for me is I see all these amazing opportunities. The op- the the one of the biggest hurdles we have is the health system we live in and work in. Does it value preventative care? Does it value, you know, getting these signals from a patient at home? Honestly, in a fee for service system, no, it does not value it. Right? They all they uh, what fee for service. You know, most health systems these days are fee-for-service, meaning that they don't get paid unless you're coming to the four walls of the hospital, right, for a clinic visit, or you're having an operation, you know, or something like that. What's really been 
fascinating for me and exciting for me is to, to see that the government, CMS, HHS, they realize that, you know, our healthcare spend is going way up. The quality of care is, if anything, is like not great compared to the rest of the world. And they say they truly do see that digital health is one of the solutions or one of the tools that could address the triple aim, right? A new solution that's less expensive, more accessible and um, scalable, right? Those that's really important. So what excites me is to see that the CMS, HHS, they're, they're really pushing, you know, more and more value-based kind of contracts. They want healthcare systems and doctors to get involved in more value-based contracts where the physicians or the health system is kind of at risk for that patient a little more so that they kind of care about the long-term outcomes. They care, they care about the preventative uh, um, or implementing uh, more preventative measures, if that makes sense. And there's, there are great examples, you know, Oshner Health System in New Orleans, Incredible. They, they, about 70, 80% of their patients are Medicare Advantage patients. So guess what? They have something called the O bar, which is almost like a genius bar for, uh, for their patients. This, and, you know, if I have blood, high blood pressure in their system in Epic, they'll put in an order, say, you know, sign up Oliver for the remote hypertension program. I walk to the Genius Bar, or the O-Bar is called. I get a subsidized blood pressure cuff. They connect it to my phone. I go home. I measure my blood pressure, and a pharmacist calls me to tell me every week, go up on this medication, go down on that medication using protocols. And guess what? They've, they've studied this. They've published on it. They can get the blood pressure under control within weeks you know, versus months you know, in the traditional way. So that's one example, and I just want to highlight you know, digital health is exciting, amazing. There are huge opportunities, but it's the whole ecosystem has to play long, right? If there are zero incentives for the physician, zero incentives for the health system, you're not going to see any implementation, right? Even though you have all this amazing technology. How do you validate the data across the different, I don't know, items? Like there's 10,000 smartwatches, there's 10,000 different phones, and there's mm-hmm. obviously going to be some variance in how your data is going to be reported based on just the different operating systems there. So how do you compare and contrast across these two and try and standardize that data? Yeah, I, I think I think that's a really good question. And there's a whole organ like a nonprofit organization called the Dime Society that I, if anyone's interested in the space, sign up to join them. They have, you know, uh, events ar- around exactly what you're talking about. They mainly focus on research, you know, like let's say your pharmaceutical company, you want to, you, you need patient reported outcomes. What should I measure? Which tools should I use? Uh, things like that. But I think you bring up a phenomenal problem, right? That all there, there are all these various tools and, and especially in research, how do you, you know, you want to standardize as much as possible to make sure there isn't a variance. But what is crazy about digital health and when you're collecting longitudinal data what is almost more important than the absolute value that you get at that one time point are the trends, right? So you kind of normalize, you know, for yourself, uh, the data normalizes for you. So if over time, you know, you start at a certain level, right? If over time that change goes up and, or, and down with that same device, you know, that's almost more important than the absolute number. It's, it's a huge problem. And we, Something I'd love, I'm very proud of is that we, you know, we open sourced a lot of the work we did. So I at Stanford have done this kind of work forever, teach around it. And so a lot of people come to our lab and say, how do you, you know, I have this research idea for digital health. How do I build an app and how do I get it launched? And it became so obvious that there's a need for, you know, just making it easier for people just to answer their research questions in digital health. So we created this open source framework called Cardinal Kit. And there's a website called cardinalkit.org where we basically provide open source tools to, you know, within literally, if you have some coding skills, you can within hours set up a basic uh, research application uh, to collect data and, you know, do it in a compliant way and things like that. But what I'm trying to get at with that story is, that we started on one platform. We started on the iOS platform, not because it's the most accessible, 
not because because we know that's a problem. We know it's the most expensive. The the bottom line is that we we you know the um, iOS front end they've done a lot of work to create this ecosystem, right? Something I don't know if you've heard of Health Kit, Research Kit, all that um, on iOS. They've created a tremendous ecosystem to make it super easy and standardized so that uh, for researchers, it's very easy to kind of use these open source frameworks to build something, right? That's meaningful. It's consistent. Plus, I know for a fact that the accelerometers in this device are far more consistent and constant than they are across all the Android devices, you know? So for research, you know, that may be a, that's one approach we took. Is it the most accessible? Absolutely not, you know? The um, and we know that, and we're trying to expand to Android and so on over time. But uh, and then for the back end, you know, we're using Google Cloud Services because they're they've done so much, they put so much energy and effort to again creating standardized, interoperable um, uh, back end and framework to to kind of make it really easy, you know, with their serverless architecture to implement. Okay, that was a great answer and. Hopefully everyone out there has a little bit of coding experience if they want to use it. If not, it's <laughs> a perfect way to learn. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the question that we have to ask, uh, how has COVID impacted this work? It's the question of the, the year, I guess. Oh, man. Yeah, so so uh, that's a great question again. If anything, I mean, everyone's heard about telemedicine or telehealth and how COVID really blew telehealth up. And, you know, the digital health world and ecosystem has has you know, if anything has just blown up uh, even more, it's had another banner year of investment and companies. And uh, this year is is even outpacing last year in terms of digital health companies uh, getting investment, you know, whether it's around remote monitoring, it's around, you know, new care delivery models, um, you know, to support these value-based care programs. Uh, so for us, COVID, you know, we actually had an ongoing study. So another project I'm working on is to work with a Society of Vascular Surgery to create a home-based exercise therapy program. So for that same condition that I was talking about at the beginning of our discussion called uh, peripheral artery disease, one of the earliest sy- symptoms is the claudication, you know, the pain you get with walking that can be pretty limiting if it becomes advanced. So it turns out one of the you know, one of the um, guideline recommendations, in addition to, you know, aspirin, statin therapy, smoking cessation is something that's called exercise therapy. It's very similar to cardiac rehab. One of the issues is we don't even offer it. You know, why? Because the reimbursement is in the toilet. You know, um, it's very low. And so we're kind of doing a lot of patients a disservice. And so the society is aware of this and to help promote kind of this comprehensive care message, you know, I was asked to help join the health IT committee of the Society of Vascular Surgery to kind of co-develop this. Um, it's called the SVS SET app. So the Society of Vascular Surgery Supervised Exercise Therapy, it's a home exercise therapy program. And we were, we were doing our study, you know, this was all started before COVID and then COVID happened and we were able to you know, enroll over a hundred, you know, almost 200 patients, uh, in our, you know, pilot study across the country all during COVID. And that's one of the beautiful things about these remote and distributed type approaches to research, you know, digital health, you know, pharma is really getting behind digital health for, to help, uh, run studies because you can get, um, you can still, you know, it doesn't require to come in person, you know, for the studies that you can, do, uh, you know, that don't require to have a blood draw an MRI or whatever, but, uh, but it, so it's actually hasn't affected us negatively, negatively. And if anything, I think COVID has accelerated digital health and there, you know, people say that we're kind of five years further ahead today than we should have been, you know, pre or work pre COVID, you know, so it's kind of a, been a kind of time accelerator. Okay. Oh man. Now that we got the, uh, the uh, elephant out of the room. (laughs) You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, 
fighting scope creep and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's Physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. How would you say um, your work um, impacts people? What do you say you think is the impact of your work? Yeah, so where I see, again, I'm going to go back to what, you know, the embrace uh, how CMS, the, you know, government, is embracing digital health, and, and it all goes to, goes to the um, kind of the mission. As, I don't know if you've heard of the 21st Century Cures Act. The final rule that recently came out is a big deal, right? They're serious. They're saying, guess what, patient or person, your health information belongs to you, and we are now mandating legally that you have access to it electronically or digitally. And guess what? We have defined the framework or the API specifically that's required for you to get access so that you now can take your, if you want, you know, that's one approach. You can take your phone and I do this. And I think you, if you're part of an Epic shop or even Cerner shop, it may be possible. Um, you can literally get access to your health records on the phone. Right now it's only 12, 13 elements. But over time, even starting, I think next year, they're you know slowly increasing that to almost all the elements of the health record, including your notes, right? Including your uh, clinical notes that you get from your um, or from your physician when they see you. So, so where I'm going with this is that, you know, what's super exciting to me and how this is impacting people is that you know you you know the message is that you know you should be able to be the steward or we'd love for you to be the steward of your health um, health records and your data, right? So that you, as you go through life, can go from one health system to the next to the next and carry all that data with you and share it as you see fit. Does that make sense? And, and unlike the current, you know, setup where it's really just living in silos and it's really hard to get data out uh, and share and so on. So the impact I see is around you know, data accessibility, um, you know, data interoperability, I think is big. And this whole kind of consumerization, I think there's a, you know, I want to keep saying accessibility, you know, there, there, there is a big opportunity to, um, you know, to kind of use digital health tools to, uh, to do a better job at addressing what, you know, whether it's the social determinants of health or just health you know, education, basic things, you know, there are a lot of, um, a lot of opportunities to kind of, you know, reach people, right? Because access to healthcare is, is, is one of the biggest issues. And so if you work with the right partners, the right, um, the right organizations, you know, I think there's a lot of potential there to uh, have even greater impact. And again, support that value-based, more preventative approach. To healthcare rather than waiting for the disaster and then going to the ER. Um, you know, fee for service is great for certain things, but unfortunately, the incentives just aren't perfectly aligned. You know, for um, you know, I'd love for a health system to carry about to worry about you know me in a preventative way. You know, kind of be looking out for ways that, to keep me from getting sick instead of just saying, "Oh, I, we provide the best care when you are sick." So when you get cancer, get whatever. You know, but when you come in, we'll take great care of you. <laughs> that's that's great. But, uh, you know, there's so much that can be done. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the charts where, you know, most of healthcare is not determined by, you know, the health care you get. <laughs> it's, it's it's based on where you live, your zip code and what you eat and how you, you know, do you exercise, not exercise, genetic, whatever. You know, there's so many other things that, you know, where this can be used to influence those factors. Um, and as we're, uh, this will be our final question here. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see the future of health IT in 10 to 15 years when I'm a practicing physician? Yeah. So I, I think you're going to see, you know, more empowered patients. You know, I think patient, I think this interoperability and, you know, patients being their own stewards of care will be, uh, will, will definitely be a, a good thing. 
you know, you're going to be looking at a lot of people's smartphones telling you like, look, this is the, <laughs> this is the data I have, or maybe them even sharing with your health system, right? They're through the fire API, their, their health data. Um, I think that's going to be important, but I think, I think you're going to, you're, you're going to see more and more value-based care. And in those value-based care settings, if you work in one, you will have the opportunity to engage, you know, with, with patients more remotely and, and, uh, you know, get data from, you know, from, um, devices that are connected, you know, things like that. It's, it's every specialty is so unique and that's the thing, uh, Every specialty will have a different way of leveraging these these tools. You know, we haven't even talked about the another big elephant in the room. You know, AI and you know how is that going to affect things? But the um, yeah, I, I think you're going to see you know a more empowered patients. You're going to see, especially around in the value based care models, you're going to see a lot you know a lot of tools being offered because the tools are available, but they're just there's no incentive to offer them and people to use them and um and i think um i think you know hopefully if i can help it you know you'll have the activity index as a a vital sign (laughs) just to give you an idea of one more thing to look at to see how you know is the patient frail or is this truly something that's affected them you know where do they live in terms of you know how active they are and how to better risk stratify you know what you decide for them Um, And then as we wrap up, are there any channels where people who are listening can follow your work or connect with you? Yeah, I mean, I have, uh, I I do have a Twitter account. I'm not that active, but I do have a Twitter account. I do make comments every now and then. So it's at Dr. Alami. And then I guess I'm on LinkedIn and um, those would probably be the two, two best places. Or if anyone wants to email me, I'm very open. It's just my last name, Alami at stanford.edu. Um, and you can feel free to reach out. And for anyone listening, Alami has two A's, so A A L A. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> all right. Well, everyone, that's all for today. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your time today, Dr. Alami. This has been Making the Round, a podcast by the American Medical Association. You can subscribe to Making the Round and other great AMA podcasts wherever you listen to yours, or visit ama-assn.org/podcast. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.